Hi, everyone. Welcome in. We're going to give a couple minutes just to let everyone join us. Um, but welcome to Art of Science session two. While we're waiting for everyone to join us, please feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you're joining us from. So welcome everyone. We're going to give a couple minute or two just to let everyone join us. Um, but please let us know where you're joining us from. Giselle, you're joining Giselle. us from Brazil. Welcome. Margo from Cincinnati, Ohio. Hello from Wisconsin. Joan. Wow, you guys are from all over. Yay. Joan's my mother-in-law. I, I mean, I'm, yeah, her son is married to my daughter. So we're mother-in-law together. Your co-mother-in-laws. Co-mother-in-laws, <laughs> which has been kind of hard this year, <laughs> just staying in touch. So welcome everyone. As you're joining us, we're gonna go ahead and get started in just another minute, um, but I wanna make sure everyone has a chance to for everything to load up. But please, if you haven't done so already, use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and let us know where you're joining us from. We have people from Brazil, from Ohio, from Wisconsin. I know there's a couple Floridians in there. Ooh. Holly from New Hampshire and Henniker. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Ed from Brazil, welcome. Okay, so it's about that time. Our attendance has leveled off sort of, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. But if you are just joining us, please feel free to use the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. But without further ado, hello, my name is Laura LeBur. I'm a marine science educator at the Smithsonian Marine Station and Ecosystem Exhibit. And welcome to our second ever Art of Science. Conversations with Creatives in Science program series. This session is gonna feature writing and science communication. And although the lines between science and art are often tightly drawn, these two disciplines can and do often influence one another in extraordinary ways to create profound expressions through visual art and writing. This series seeks to highlight creative individuals with a scientific background in a conversation on how their scientific understanding of the world influences, enhances, and guides their art. So this will be a series of three evening programs from March through May. So you're joining us for our middle session. And they broadcast live on Zoom and live on Facebook. So if you're also joining us on Facebook, welcome. We're so happy that you're here with us. Each program features up to three artists on a panel and will be conversational in nature. So rather than an interview or a lecture style program, time will be built in to, for the panelists to give the audience tips and tricks. For aspiring artists and audience members, you will be encouraged to ask questions to the panelists. Um, so this is kind of a new platform that we're, all the panelists will do an introduction and then it's up to the attendees, all of you wonderful participants to ask questions in the Q and A and we'll get into that in just a second. So while people are joining, like I said before, please feel free to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to let us know where you're joining us from. Um, and I just like to point out some key features. You can use the Q and A box at the bottom of the screen to ask questions to our guests. The Q&A button is the one that has two speech bubbles at the bottom, and you can submit a question at any time as it comes to you throughout the entire introduction. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as possible, but please um, be patient with us as there was a lot of questions in the last session, and we'll try and ask them as they're appropriate. If you'd like to ask a specific panelist a question, make sure to say so in your question, and we'll direct the questions to them. I'll be directing them. There's another educator in the background to keep track of your questions. So if you see a message in the chat box, it will be coming from Erin um, and she's gonna be helping me facilitate today's program. So 
You can use the chat box to send us messages and answer any questions we ha may have for you. Your comments are visible only to Smithsonian staff, so please keep them on topic and appropriate. And please put your questions in the Q&A. We'll be monitoring that to make sure that we're keeping engagement high. Um, so this webinar will be recorded and can be found on our Facebook and YouTube channel. Today's program will feature a short introduction by the panelists and we'll spend the majority of the time, like I said, having a conversation about their creative journeys and taking audience questions. So make sure that you're putting those questions in the Q&A for us, okay? Um, we have some people joining us from Singapore. Good morning, Teresa, it's 6 a.m. to you there. And Michael, thank you so much for joining us from Rockfish Depot in Virginia. Welcome to all of you. Um, and let's get started. So it's my extreme pleasure to introduce the panelists for today's session. We have joining us Dr. Judith Winston, a scientist and author of Seaweeds, a Marine Biology Mystery. We have Dr. Nick Pyanson, a curator at the National Museum of Natural History and author of Spying on Whales. And we have Tiffany Duong, a science journalist and communicator who uses her stories to enact global change. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Jude, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself first? Um, shall I show the slides? Yeah, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, I will be the first guinea pig here. I'm the old guy and the amateur when it comes to literature. And I'm starting off with some old black and white pictures of what influenced me very much in my life. I Thank come you. from a small town uh, from a family of readers. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we need you to retry sharing your screen for me, please. Oh no. It's okay. okay. Go ahead and hit the share screen at the bottom of the green. That okay. means I have to get rid of the PowerPoint. No, no. Yeah, this is a Mac. It doesn't seem to want to do both. Okay, now we've got it. Nope, it's still not up for us. So go ahead still and not up. Okay. hit your share screen. And then when it comes up, make sure you click the PowerPoint thing. There we okay. go. All right, we'll try again. I really am an amateur at this. That's okay, you're, you're getting practice makes perfect, makes progress. So I'll start again. I come from a small town, but I come from a family of readers. My mother was an elementary school teacher. My father was a salesman who loved murder mysteries or mysteries of all kinds. And by the time I was in third grade, I was hiding under my parents' bed when they were not around to read his mysteries because the ones for kids were just kind of boring. So that was a good thing to be a reader. And I've been a reader all my life and a reader of mysteries and, and just every kind of book imaginable except romance novels. Um, this was my school, my elementary school built in 1901. And I put that in because I'm left-handed and dyslexic. Um, and I was doing all right in school. I was doing actually with most things doing great. But in fourth grade, I had a teacher who decided we should learn to write with ink and pens and the ink in little ink wells. And as a left-handed person, I'd always dragged my hand to pull the pen across the paper, as you do with a left, left to right language. Well, you can't do that with wet ink. So I had to learn to write all over again. And I've never quite caught up. My hand still will not keep up with my brain. But at any rate, by the time I got toward high school, we were in the middle of the Cold War. And every student who liked science was not compelled, but strongly encouraged to go into science. Um, 
And since I loved biology and art, both, I decided, well, no, biology. I, when I was a child, I liked to play in the water. So I became a woman who played in the water and I haven't stopped playing in the water yet. I became a marine biologist for other reasons too. We live in an ocean planet. I love to study the different invertebrates, which are like aliens from another planet, when you start to look at their lives. Um, so I went on studying bryozoans mainly and working in a museum because I liked this kind of taxonomy, ecology, collections-based research. But what does it turn out that scientists do? Well, they go to meetings, they go to workshops, ugh, and they publish papers because if science, if research isn't shared, it's not science, it's just a hobby. So they write and they write all the time and they write in many different formats. And every time I've gone to a career day, the students are not happy to find out that they better study and learn how to write because they think it's all playing with dolphins and whales. But there's a lot of that. Um, and you can see that I'm bad at these things. But anyway, I went on and as I got closer to retirement, I decided I wanted to do something else. And I thought, I've read a lot of good mysteries and the ones I liked best were by people who knew what they were talking about. You know, Dick Francis started writing about jockeys and they talked about racing and saddles and racehorses. Nevada Barr wrote about park rangers and their duties in the wild of the different parks. And I thought, well, you know, there isn't really a good book about marine biology, one that's really accurate as far as what scientists do. And what scientists, marine scientists do is they spend a lot of time at small marine stations like this one in the picture. It looks so nice and modern and it is. Oop, I just, um, I should give up, but. No, you're doing great. Um, the, uh, this marine station is haunted. There's a ghost. So there are so many ways to kill people in the ocean. I won't say anyone was murdered here, but somebody had a very unfortunate accident and nobody knows too much about it. So anyway, I would just say that if you want to start doing this, the best thing you can do is read mysteries. Um, but taking the first step for me, I, I had looked at all these books on writing mysteries and I'd gone to conferences, which can teach you a lot. The, the forensic ones are amazing where you get to use luminol and um, make blood stains on things. But you can also go to the summer writers workshops. But what really got me started was that National Novel Writing Month um, helped me, you know, firm up a first draft. You just write a couple of thousand pages a day. And if you do it long enough, you have 50,000 words and there's a start with the first draft. But I've put some of these in the uh, reference sections. I finally decided that as an older author, I was never going to get an agent because the established agents are not taking new authors. It's very tight field publishing these days. So I thought, well, I'll learn how to do a Kindle book. And that was what I did. And they were very helpful. It got done. They also give you an author page. And um, that's about all I want to say, but happy to answer questions. Awesome. Thanks, Jude, so much for sharing your journey. I'm sure people will ask some really good questions about how you chose to self-publish on Kindle ebook and um, maybe Maybe people will want a little, little teaser. I don't know if you're willing to give one or not. Um, I think it's really cool what you said about mysteries. I've read so many also, and I feel like sometimes they just don't get the science right. So it's always exciting to me when 
scientists write fiction books because you know it's coming from a place of like real and true fact whereas some people use science and you're like mm, no, it's not quite <laughs> no, how it like works that. I've read some scuba diving mysteries that were just like "Ooh, no though like <laughs> nobody would do that if you've ever seen the movie Meg they like defy scuba laws like left and right Tiffany's shaking her head yeah <laughs> And isn't there one, the deep, where, where you can see the ripples on the surface of the swimming pool <laughs> that they're in? Exactly. And anyway, um, we but do I, hired, I hired a freelance editor before I put my final version on Kindle. So that I highly would recommend. Awesome. And maybe uh, we'll have everyone do introductions, but if somebody has a question about like, how do you find freelance writers or editor or sorry, freelance editors, um, we can talk more about that, but let's let Tiffany introduce herself and then we'll get to Nick's introduction as well. All right. Let us share real quick. And... All right, everyone see that? Okay, so, oh my computer. Hi, it's very nice to meet you. My name is Tiffany Duong and I'm an environmental reporter, a scientific scuba diver, conservation advocate. I teach climate courses and I explore. And the common vein through all of that is that I use science and storytelling to create positive change for the planet. I didn't always wield a machete in the Amazon. I actually used to be a pretty unhappy lawyer. This is me on my first day um, of law training at my law firm. And I did that. I, I became a lawyer because I wanted to make a difference for the planet, but I didn't know how to do that. And so I went to school um, for environmental law and climate change law, and I became a renewable energy lawyer for law, it was pretty awesome. Like I got to build contracts and projects like these wind turbines in Tehachapi, California, or really big solar thermal farms. It was cutting edge renewable energy science put out in the real world. But I just didn't feel like I was personally reaching enough people. The day that I took this picture was literally the only day in my six year career as a lawyer where I got to leave my office and not just stare at a pile of paper. I didn't see people engaging with this work. And so I knew I needed a change. The lifestyle was pretty unhealthy for me. And as an escape, I would actually write Yelp reviews in between contracts. So you're looking at my very first Yelp review right here. It's for a food truck in Philly. That's where I went to school at UPenn. And this was my first taste of writing in public. This was the first time I actually put my writing out in the world for people to judge and see. And when I look back at this, I actually see the progression of my own writing style, even in Yelp reviews, right? I start with like sections and I, you know, I have a lead paragraph and I talk about sensory input. So even back then I wanted to help people experience the world of food through, you know, sensory. And eventually I went to the Galapagos on a scuba diving trip and that inspired me to quit my job, sell my house, change my whole life, and campaign for the oceans. And it has been the journey of my life and created a path that I'm so thrilled to be on. So basically, I felt so alive and wild in that ocean. I knew I didn't want to stop feeling like that again. Um, when I quit, I had no plan other than to follow that hunch of what made me feel alive. And while I was on that ship, I realized like, oh, I think I want to try science. I want to try field work. You know, I had this notion that I didn't try marine science in college. I never really gave myself the option of even exploring science as a career. And so I was like, OK, I need to see if this is something I want to do. Do I want to go back to school? So I chose to move to the Amazon to do field work. And um, that's a picture of me in Las Piedras, it's in Peru. And I moved to a biodiversity research camp there in 2016 to basically, we used to go out and do rapid assessment surveys 
to see what animals were there. And then we would bring that to the government and try to get them to not build new roads that would cut down the forest and open it up to miners and poachers. This was the first time that I had tried field work. And um, it was a good thing because I realized that my limit for like actual, like in the rainforest field work, comfort is about two weeks. So science maybe wasn't quite for me. And um, that was a really important realization. I wanna emphasize that this really kickstarted for me taking a scientific approach to my career change. I was testing out hypotheses. Will I like field work, oceans or rainforest? You know, how in depth do I wanna be? Do I wanna write policy? Do I wanna write articles? And every step in my career thus far has had pros and cons. And I treat each one like a data point, right? If I don't like something, instead of taking the mindset of, oh my gosh, I failed, I didn't find, you know, my new career, I didn't find my new life purpose. I took it as just a, okay, you didn't like two weeks in the Amazon. That maybe was too much. Try oceans, you know, try something else. You don't judge data points, you learn from them. And so I took that approach to my career and I just kept refining my search with every little thing I learned. So like I said, in the rainforest, I learned that science can inform policy. I thought that was really powerful. I started writing stories about places, right? This is when I moved from food to the wild. And I wasn't writing on a big platform. I shared it on my Instagram, right? You can still find it there. I talk about like mushrooms and howler monkeys and just how those filled me with wonder. My next job, you can see in this series of pictures here, I became an ocean and policy advocate. So I realigned with the oceans. I was like, okay, it's definitely oceans. It's not land-based. I felt like I was making a difference here. I used to talk to local councils. I was, I used to moonlight basically as like a shark in front of Whole Foods to try to get people to not eat unsustainably caught swordfish. I really felt like I was making a difference. And for the first time I was using communication skills based in science to talk to people, right? We used DriftNet data to tell people why eating a swordfish actually would kill a turtle or a whale or a seabird. Um, we used data about where salmon spawn to try to fight a golf course. And it was all these things that really helped me understand the role that science could play to move people. But I wanted to cover more topics. And so I kept evolving my search. I moved to the Florida Keys where I met Laura to become a coral restoration diver. That's that first picture. I also tried shark tagging in Cocos Island, Costa Rica, and I did a lot of dives against debris. That was my way of trying just, you know, backtracking a little and being like, do I wanna do ocean field work? And um, after nine days in a row of diving, I realized, you know, this is my like second, third career. I'm tired. I don't know if I wanna go back to school for marine bio, which was, you know, always in the back of my mind. So then what that led me to was environmental reporting and education and expedition support, which is where I'm currently sitting, right? I do field reporting. So I get to dive to tell stories about the oceans, about what's happening, about coral reefs or the scientists who are saving them. And I combine the science of what, what we see, you know, for instance, 2% of coral reefs in Florida are left with the stories about, you know, the scientists who invented ways to try to bring the reef back. And I combine those two things, science and storytelling, to move people to action. And I, for me, this is how I know that I'm adding to the conversation. And this is my brand of science communication. And it makes me feel so proud every day just to be able to give this message out into the world. So I just wanted to share real quick the evolution of my, my actual writing that wasn't food trucks and sandwiches in Philly. Um, on the left, you'll see, this is the first newspaper article I ever published. It is a whale necropsy. And you'll actually see it's not even an article. It's a long caption. I didn't feel comfortable writing a whole big piece and you can't read it, but it's basically facts. It's saying like, 
oh, there's a necropsy. I don't even explain what that means. The lay public doesn't necessarily know what that means. So I use technical jargon. I focused on facts instead of the story. I said, oh, it's a 28 ton whale. It was caught here, you know, found here. But I didn't tell its story, right? It didn't move people. It was just news. And two years later, scientists actually found out that that exact same whale that I happened to see in the Everglades was a new species of whale that they had never found, that they, they finally confirmed it, and that it had died of plastic ingestion. So in those two years, my writing had evolved through a lot of practice, like over 400 stories. I took a lot of writing courses. I asked for constructive criticism everywhere I could. And so now I turn that one picture that was just a little factual caption into this giant paragraph, you know, that's a uh, par- article that has been viewed and read and commented on like thousands and thousands of times. And this to me really shows me like how much, you know, practice can progress you. And if you try to understand the story behind it, right? Like this well wasn't just a dead animal that washed up. It tells the story of climate change. It tells the story of endangered species. It tells the story of plastic pollution altogether, you know? So that to me kind of shows where scientific writing can go and the power it can have. And um, to end, I will share one of my latest pieces that I'm really proud of, right? This was, uh, this really captures for me what my brand of storytelling is. It was a cover story for Alert Diver magazine. And I was commissioned to write this piece about my personal connection to the seas. So I actually got to share my story about quitting my law career after that trip to the Galapagos and how the oceans have helped me find myself. And then I got to talk to some really amazing people who had a different connection to the ocean, but we all shared that same vein of like the oceans sustain us, sustain life. And the response to this piece has been really powerful. It's deeply personal. It has science mixed in. You know, I talk about the economics of Um, marine protected areas. I talk about how they can bring up local communities in a spillover effect, you know, the same way that they do ecologically with fish, but it's mixed in with a personal story. And so it makes it come alive. And it leaves me with a lesson that I would love to share of just follow your joy. You know, I couldn't have written this if I hadn't immersed myself in field work in the Amazon and then coral restoration and then took it further, connecting it to climate change and identity and just keep keeping all the keeping the idea that everything is connected you know to the wild to us and to show a way to share that and now um what's coming up for me is that if it will load if why I, don't we, i'm sorry to interrupt you but why don't we save what's coming up next for the end and we can share like what is your next steps and journey sure Does that feel cool. good for you awesome. yeah I love your story and I think it's so unique because you got a real opportunity to try so many different things. And I think what's really cool if there's young people in the audience um, who are joining us, I think it's really good advice to try different things, especially when you're early on in your career, because it's a unique way. Like when you're at, if you're at school or at college to do a one or two week field work course and see like, do I like sleeping in bunk beds in the middle of the woods and using very primitive bathrooms? Because that's not for everyone. Um, Or do I like scuba diving nine days in a row and doing um, underwater hammering? Because that's also not for everyone. Um, So I think that's really cool. And I love the example that you shared of like your first caption. And then it's so nice that that article came back and it was able to be an article and that you got to revisit that um, and do like a full article about it. Um, We're going to transition now to Dr. Nick Pyanson. And then I noticed we have a few questions in the Q&A, but before we get into it, I just want to remind everyone, um, we're going to take them after everyone does their introductions. I noticed we have a few in there, but if you have any other questions that kind of come up, there's no such thing as a silly question. If you're thinking it, chances are that somebody else is thinking it too. So please make sure that you're putting those questions in our Q&A. Um, and without further ado, Dr. Nick, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, thanks, Laura, and thanks to the uh, Smithsonian Marine Station for inviting me to this. I'm really happy to join the group of panelists here to talk about um, creativity and art and science. And I think uh, 
Um, hopefully I'll be able to echo a few of the messages that I think have been shared so far by uh, the other analysts, both Jude and Tiffany. Um, I, uh, what I should say, I guess, is, let's see, I got this all ready to go here. Um, uh, so I'm coming to you from, my name's Nick Pineson. I'm a curator at the Natural History Museum uh, in uh, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. And uh, my, I guess I would say my day job is being a paleontologist uh, at the Natural History Museum. But um, I think a thread that connects up to something that uh, Tiffany mentioned is that I think storytelling is one of the most important aspects of uh, what I can do to communicate what's important about my work. And uh, I, I take that seriously because uh, your tax dollars support my, my salary as I'm a federal employee. Um, and uh, I think there's a really important uh, component of the job that I do, not just as a researcher, but as a communicator. Um, my job involves um, basic research science, taking care of fossil collections at the National Museum uh, here in Washington, DC, uh, mentoring students from around the world, uh, including all stripes of education from uh, college students all the way through uh, postdoctoral fellows and visiting faculty. And then also um, what we what previously has been called education and outreach, but I just think of as uh, different forms of communication. And I think that's that's kind of what uh, one of the essential themes that we're talking about here, storytelling. And in science, the stories we tell are, are real. Uh, they're about real things. And uh, one of the um, groups that I, I have studied uh, throughout my career are whales, like the one you see here uh, and you, that you saw on the title slide. These are both, in both images, they're humpback whales. Um, the same one actually uh, in Wilhelmina Bay in Antarctica. And uh, this is a shot from my uh, screen capture from a GoPro camera on my forehead. Um, and we were very close to these humpback whales. Um, this is austral summer, so our winter. But in the austral summer, humpback whales come to Antarctica to feed on krill, krill by the billions, trillions uh, in huge abundances. And uh, they migrate there in, summer, in the austral summer and go back to uh, lower latitudes during the winter to reproduce, to uh, give birth, and then undertake that whole cycle again. And uh, whales are so interesting to me, and this is kind of the second theme, and I think this is true for a lot of marine biologists, and you heard it echoed in in Jude's talk, um, there's so much we don't know about the oceans and the life in the oceans on this planet. Um, we're, uh, as Tiffany pointed out, we're still discovering species of whales. Uh, here we are in 2021, and we still don't know all the species of whales that are on this planet. And uh, that's kind of an amazing thing for anybody who thinks that everything is just known and scientists are filling in the details. No, we're still mapping out large parts of this planet. And uh, it is a water planet. 70% uh, of the surface is covered in water of one kind or another. So um, we want to know more about the water in all of its ways, and especially the things that live in there. And we think that whales are um, interesting for a lot of reasons. If you're a scientist, they're big animals. They're mammals, just like you and me. They breathe air. And so they're tied to the surface, but they only spend 99% of their or they only spend a fraction of their life uh, at the surface. 99% of it is spent underwater. And uh, so they're big animals, live in a big environment, and uh, they're hard to track. That's not our native place. And so if you wanna know something about them, you have to be very clever as a scientist. And the reason why we're in Antarctica here, just to fill in the story, is to put a removable suction cup tag onto their back, which then tells us, gives us data, information about what those animals do when they're not at the surface how they feed, how they swim, uh, how, they, how long can they breathe. Um, all those facts are really interesting. And I was there, again, as a paleontologist because of uh, my colleagues. And when you find the right colleague, you can discover that the questions you ask are right at the boundaries of knowledge. And that's when science gets really interesting, at least to me. Uh, you ask questions that you both wanna know the answer to that you may not have. And um, that's, that's because science is an ever evolving um, set of knowledge. And you do wanna push the boundaries, I think. That's, that's what makes it exciting, at least for me. Uh, but I realized full well that as a paleontologist, um, if you went on a whale watch, 
to know about the origins of whales, whales didn't always look like this. They actually looked a bit like this. And this is, this is where we get to the creative aspect of storytelling in science that um, really captivates me is that it's not just about telling us, um, giving us information about things that are real. And I'll share a bit more about, you know, that's, that's very tangible for a paleontologist because you deal with bones, but it does require uh, a trip of the ima imagination to um, imagine things that we, and no one has ever seen, but we know actually happened. Uh, we have some traces of that. So you have to be kind of a detective and use the powers of imagination to uh, proffer what you think these animals once looked like, what, what the first whales looked like. And we know that they uh, didn't have a tail fluke. They had weight-bearing limbs. So they had hind limbs and forelimbs uh, that didn't look like flippers at all. And they had a long snout with teeth. Uh, their nostrils were at the end. They hardly looked like a whale. But there's key features of their skeleton that we find in the false record that tells us they're like whales. And so this illustration is an original lino cut that was made uh, by an artist who was formerly a student of mine, who, who started off as a scientific researcher and then became a scientific illustrator. Her name is Alex Borzma. And she illustrated every uh, image of, in the book that I wrote, Spying on Whales, uh, in the same fashion, because I wanted a consistent kind of way that, that was familiar. Um, a little bit graphical, a little bit stylized, but still told us something important about what you needed to know. And this is, you know, the most important fact for this image is that whales will, once lived on land um, and had four legs and scurried about, and sometimes lit, fed in a swampy kind of environment. That's so different from the way they are today. 50 million years ago, you wouldn't have predicted that they would have evolved into the giants that they are today. So um, if we and this is what's powerful about the, the real information, fossils tell us about something we wouldn't otherwise know. And, and they tell us about that over the span of geologic time, over millions of years. And uh, if you, you know, this, um, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History is closed, but if you could walk off the National Mall, and hopefully we'll be able to do this again someday when the museum opens up, you could walk into the Sant Ocean Hall and see this. This is a 40 million year old fossil whale. Um, and I won't go into the details just to say that this is kind of caught, this animal is caught somewhere between the whales that once lived on land and the whales that we know today that are living in the water full time. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner of this image, you can see little dinky hind limbs that it inherited from ancestors that once lived on land and are no longer useful. And that's just how evolution works. Uh, it doesn't work with a forward-looking plan. It, it changes through time. Uh, by the selection pressures and the haphazard uh, um, directions that, that carry these lineages forward, many of which go extinct. Most of the fossil, most of the whale species that ever lived over the course of 50 million years are no longer on this planet. And if we're lucky, we find their fossils and they tell us something about how they once were. And that's amazing to me. That's, that's the part of the imagination that really captivates me. Um, and we can arrange this in a family tree. And this is, again, where art uh, takes prominence. Um, many people have illustrated what they think early whales look like. Uh, and that's a challenge because we actually just have the bones. So you do have to um, color them. You have to decide whether or not you put hair on them and you have to decide how you depict them. Uh, these are all illustrations that were actually made by one artist named Carl Buell uh, that I just pulled to fill in the family tree of early whales. These are all the whales that are now extinct, but show us these transitions, these transformations of how whales once were to how whales are today, all the way up to humpbacks that we see, uh, that you saw earlier in this slide. Um, the, and I'll just um, quickly go through, you know, what, just to reiterate this message, here are the real things, uh, the fossils that in the hands of a former student is now Dr. Carlos Pareto at the University of Michigan uh, are the examples of fossil whale teeth. And some of which you can actually find in Florida that aren't too dissimilar from this, but, um, when you have the information in your hands, it's tangible, it tells you something real, it once existed and we're lucky enough to find it. And your ability to know something about its significance is about asking the right scientific question. But it is incomplete and, it, and it's hard to sometimes get a full picture unless you get lucky. And uh, I just wanted to share a quick example of how we visualize the information that we do have. This is an image from a fossil site that I had the opportunity to work, in, uh, work on a few years ago with Chilean collaborators in a, Part of the Atacama Desert where uh, the Pan American Highway went right through a hillside that had dozens of fossil whales. And uh, I kind of tell the saga of, of how we um, came to find this site and what, how we studied it. 
but what I can show you here is that we were able to actually digitize, uh, collect 3D information using um, equipment that really should be in a lab and not taken out to the field. Uh, but what that did is that did give us 3D models. And I'm actually going to break out of the slideshow here and reshare my Chrome browser, if I can. And um, here, and, and I know that um, Aaron will put the link into the chat, so you don't have to worry if you can't see this, but I'll just take you on the tour. This is that same whale skeleton. And I'll slowly scroll through it because we have the 3D model now on a website. And uh, what's fantastic about this is that it shows us information. This is a, a snapshot of work in the field. You know, um, uh, Tiffany was just talking about her love of field work. And, and um, this is a way to freeze that moment, at least the scientific information, and bring it back to the lab because we're under incredible time constraints. And um, one of the great things about this is that this is actually information that uh, you can even download and print for yourself at home. You can make these little 3D prints of these whales like this. And that's, that's um, one of the things that makes, I think, the Smithsonian um, a leader. And that's part of the role that we fulfill, which is being able to share this information freely and openly across the nation and across the world. And that's, that's another aspect of communicating, revealing the mystery, but also sharing it broadly so that anybody can access it. And uh, none of these fossils ever left the country. Uh, they all stayed in Chile. And that's a really important important part of the scientific collaborations that I think um, we should undertake now in 2021 is that these are true collaborations. They're not about um, researchers from, say, the United States taking advantage of uh, interactions in scientific data in another country. That, that science diplomacy is really an important part of the work that uh, I think the Smithsonian should do as, as, a, as a public diplomacy institution. So I'll just wrap it up to say that um, these animals are fundamentally mysterious. We're still finding out more and more about them. Uh, and that's not just true about whales, that's true about any branch on the tree of life, and especially for those in the ocean, whether it's bryzoa or uh, sea cows, you have manatees in Florida. Uh, there's so many questions we, don't, we haven't yet asked, and that should be inspiring to anybody who's um, a budding scientist or an amateur scientist in the audience. We have the kind of information, much of which is available online, that if you ask the right question, you may make a fundamental discovery that professional scientists have missed. And I think about this when I look at the kind of information that we can get today from humpback whales in Antarctica. This is an image uh, collected from a drone uh, several hundred feet up in the air. And it's giving you the kind of information about a bubble net. These bubbles are emitted by the nostrils of one humpback whale and another one comes in from underneath. The krill and the fish all get gathered together and it's like um, eating fish in a barrel. And this is the kind of information I can never imagine uh, seeing when I was a grad student. And so I do think that this is kind of the golden age for studying science in the oceans and certainly for whale science. And uh, I think that should be a point of inspiration for anybody who wants to grapple with mysteries, but also try to understand them through any kind of visualiz visualization, whether it's about writing, whether it's about um, uh, drawing, or whether it's about interacting with the data itself. And that's where I'll, I'll leave it. Cool, thank you, Nick. I think what's really cool, um, I bet all of the attendees didn't realize they were gonna get mystery, intrigue, drama with all of the um, panelists today, but we really, we do have it all. Um, and what's fascinating to me is that, you know, whales are so big, but we literally don't know that much about them um, because we don't spend as much time underwater. And it's interesting that like new species are still being identified, new behaviors. Um, Nick, I think it's really cool that you showed that slide in the Chilean desert and there's whale bones there. So, you know, you have to lead you to all these other assumptions. Like what did that habitat look like prior? <laughs> Um, and I'm sure, you know, you're finding other fossilized animals as well in, in, in those regions. And now you can sort of piece together this mosaic narrative of like what that looked like. Um, so it's really, really intriguing, but I think you brought up another topic that's really important to me as a young scientist. I used to get so frustrated in biology 101 in college, like there's nothing left to study. Everyone studied everything. Like, what am I going to pick? Like, I don't really like plants, I don't really know, but there's nothing like animals, everyone's figured out all the animals. And then you find out that like, we literally haven't. And you know, Jude, you've identified like 
many species of bryozoans, you're like the leading expert on this very small marine invertebrate. And it's just like the world is really your oyster if you just pick something and ask the right questions. Like you said, Nick, I think it's really, really cool. So with that, speaking of asking questions, I'm going to transition us to some that we've had from our audience. So thank you to everyone who's put a question in the Q&A. If you haven't got around to it yet, you are welcome to do so. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions of our panelists. Um, so Iris asks a good question, and I think it's something we can ask all three of you. So Iris says, how long did it take you to write your first novel? Um, and she asked this question, Jude, after you. So we'll let you go first, but maybe um, you can talk about how long it took you to write your novel. Nick, I'm going to ask you the same question. And Tiffany, perhaps you can talk about how long it takes you to research and write one of your articles. Because um, I think it is interesting to see like how much really goes into these you know you have the final thing in your hand and you're like oh that doesn't seem so bad but then really it's like hours and hours of research and study and revisions and whatever so I'll turn it over to you Jude. Okay um writing the first draft isn't so hard um that could take a month but getting to a second draft and a third draft and a fourth draft. And probably about the third draft is where you want to show it to some friends, preferably friends that like to read mysteries. And you get suggestions back and you work on it some more. And so it ended up being several years from the first feeling like I'm really going to commit and put something on paper. And I used to do that during my lunch hour. Um, when I was down at the, working at the Marine Station, I would sit out there and uh, eat my sandwich or whatever and try to work a page or two on a mystery. So, but then I did take professional advice and get a freelance editor who did not like all the science. She was not a very, but she did a good job overall of uh, teaching me the things like well, you get to the end of the chapter and it should always end with suspense. You know, things that, you know, you read. And again, the best thing you can do, even while you're writing something, is to read other people. And when you've read, reread it. And ideally, if you read the book, you listen to an audio version because you you hear things that you didn't pick up at all the first time around. So there's, it's a long learning process. Um, not as bad as writing nonfiction though, I have to say it's a lot more fun, even at the end than writing a scientific paper. And when you've written, written a 500 page book and I don't know how many scientific papers, the, the whole idea again of freedom and that you are teaching people something about the planet as you do it, uh, it's great. So Jude, I'll ask you a follow-up question too, because Giselle has um, one that kind of ties into what you were saying. So it took you this long and so many, so many days of eating your sandwich out on the patio writing, <laughs> um, but they want to know if you're planning a second book. I have the first draft of the second one and an outline of two more. So. We'll see. What I haven't done is try to market the book. And again, it's not cheap to hire a freelance editor. Uh, the Kindle books now, they have very good uh, cover, ways to help you design a nice cover. Um, but to market a book is, you know, you have to invest more money in it. And I, I kind of felt like the first one, I could just get it out there. The second one, then there really is a series to try to market, so we'll see. <laughs> to be determined. Yeah. And Nick? Um, so my book, uh, the stories in my book took place over the course of um, my entire scientific career. There's kind of more, of, I, I didn't share much about how I came to be a scientist because that's, that's in the book. 
and it's not i don't know how interesting it is to many people but because uh, you know i really want to focus on um i did share a bit of it um uh, not all that i always like museums and um one of the questions in the Q&A was, uh, you know, I'm trying to make this decision about do you do science or writing? Um, if you want to do science, it takes a long time to get to the point where you can contribute in a fundamental way, if that's what you want to do. Um, you just, there's so much that you have to know in order to know what's not known and uh, to cover your fundamentals and then get to the point where you, uh, you're not passively learning, but actively contributing. Uh, and that's a, that's a transformation that takes a while some people sometimes it takes people longer than others and um and, and so i you know probably about 20 years of, of science was went into my book i wrote it in about 14 months um and i do not recommend doing that um it, it was really hard it was one of the hardest things i've ever done and um it, uh, i would probably do it differently if i did it again i'll do that differently for my for when the next time i write nonfiction. Um, but, but I do want to echo what Jude said, which was that it's really different from writing papers. Uh, scientific papers are kind of the bread and butter for a professional scientist. And uh, that's kind of what I get graded on these days uh, is uh, contributing scientific papers, um, peer reviewed papers. You have to make it through peer review. That's kind of like every time you step up to the plate, you face fastballs from, from people who are anonymous and can just torpedo any project you have. Sometimes so, they don't like it. Yeah, um, it's part of the game scientists play, and you either like it or you don't. But um, writing, um, telling a story is a very different thing. Even though if in the specifics of, of writing a technical paper, you might be telling a story, you're still using a language that's very technical and specific. Whereas when you are writing fiction or nonfiction, in both cases, you're trying to reach a, a particular kind of reader. And I, I thought, for me, that was really important to keep in my head. Who am I writing? for. And uh, for me, it was somebody uh, like a college student. And um, what I realized in the course of doing it was in part, one of the, one of the audience members was a younger version of me, my you know, 16, 17 year old self. And uh, I, I'm surprised to see, to hear from people who read the book that a lot of them are high school students and even middle schoolers. That, that's not who I intended to write for, but it's still connected with. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. Um, and it, it, it was such an exercise in learning how to, how to write uh, in a compelling way. And I'm sure Tiffany does this a lot. Um, these days I write more uh, op-ed kind of pieces and essays. Uh, and I'm very interested in, in the role of science as it fits into the major challenges of our time, biodiversity loss, climate change, how we cooperate uh, internationally, uh, nation to nation using science. Uh, that's really kind of um, some of the most important stuff I think we can do. And uh, as, as a professional scientist, I think there is a role for, for people who can speak about what science tells us and what it doesn't. And that's not always clear to everybody, uh, I think, who may not have that kind of, um, have spent the time in the, tra in the trenches um, be become doing science. I think that's really interesting and I liked really what you said about like science diplomacy and how um, it is something that moving forward, I mean we should have been taking it in consideration this whole time, but especially moving forward we need to be very mindful um, of how, like how we collect specimens and how we source materials and I think Tiffany this was something you mentioned too in your talk when you went to Peru to do research like making sure that everything that you researched is accessible um, and, re and really reporting that back and sharing and sharing those and, and including you know the people that are that live there that you're doing this research around um, and really making it sustainable and you know bringing it all full circle. Um, so Tiffany, what about you? I know you do a lot of research for your articles um, and maybe perhaps it's shifted for you the amount of time that you've put into it over time. But I think um, what Nick said kind of segues really well into your the way that you tell stories. Sure. Um, so I guess a good comparison for me would be I used to write legal notes and I wrote one on um, fisheries and slavery in, in longline fisheries. And that note took me six months full-time research. And I also wouldn't recommend that. It was a, a bear to get out. Um, it was like a 30, 40 page note. Um, now my articles are like 500 words. 
to 800 words. That's like a two to four minute read. Um, you know, it's something you're going to scroll on your phone and it, that probably can take me between two and six hours to research. So those knock out a lot quicker, but I had to put in, you know, the three, four years of, of background knowledge in all the different things I tried to be able to understand and, and put things together. Yeah, and to tell really compelling stories. I think your, you know, your, the fieldwork that you have done really helps you be able to share that. And like you said, um, really be able to, to communicate. Um, and I think what's interesting that you, that you mentioned earlier and that Nick, you just mentioned in this question is the, the audience um, and really making sure that the audience is with you the whole time. And I think Jude, you probably, I think it's great because all three of you have had this in which you have to really bring the audience with you on this journey, whether it's a mystery, whether it's learning about whales, whether it's communicating um, different, like multitude of science topics and marine topics, um, whale necropsies or plastic pollution or any of the other things, um, Tiffany, you've written about so many topics like mangrove conservation and all these other things. So really bringing your audience along. Um, and I think that's really good advice for any new writer is to really, before you sit down and, and write something, think about like, who are you writing this for? And what is like, what are they gonna get from it? Um, because once you identify your audience, it's really, I wouldn't say, I hesitate to use the word easy, but identifying your audience and writing for them is probably one of the hardest ways, like things you need to do to get started. Would you all agree? For sure. Um, and that audience can, uh, I help, uh, or I, it helps me at least to, to imagine actually speaking to that person. And um, I mean, the writing process uh, when you're trying to do that is, I find uh, really difficult, really challenging, and takes a lot of practice. And I guess, you know, the, I'm thinking about one of the other questions in the, in the chat here. Science takes a long time to learn how to do if you want to go down that path. I think for writing, um, what helped me was uh, finding writers who you really admire, who are able to tell stories that made you feel something. Uh, one of my favorite writers uh, that influenced me uh, a long time ago uh, was uh, Robert Spolsky, who has written a lot of different books. Um, Primates Memoir is kind of one of the most essential, I think, of those, and he tells the story of his own science development as a scientist uh, through fieldwork in Africa. And, the chapters are different all throughout the book. Some of them are really funny. Some of them are sad. Some of them are serious. Some of them are about science and some of them aren't. And um, that's, that's a very sophisticated way to tell a story. That's not the only way to do it. Um, one of my most favorite books recently is Sirens of Mars, which is written by Sarah Stewart Johnson, who's a professor at Georgetown University. Actually, I have another book right here. Um, this is a great, this is maybe one of, uh, I think it's the best science uh, writing I've ever read. Um, and it, it beats the pants off of uh, everything else I've read because it's telling a story about how we know about another planet through her story. And, um, and the writing is, is beautiful and, and compelling. And the story is about um, the most wondrous thing, you know, some, knowing about a planet that uh, no human has been to, but we sent a bunch of robots to go find out, to be our surrogates. And um, that's, I don't know how much more grand you get. You know, I think the, that goes back to the story science, scientists tell are real stories. And, you know, Jude, you wanted to tell something real about what marine biologists do, because that was an essential part of the novels uh, to frame it. And, yeah, you know, and I think I was influenced when I was in college by reading especially not a mystery, but John Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts book, The Log from the Sea of Cortez, just, you know, it stayed in my life the whole time. And I'd like to be able to tell a story um, that would influence people to think about the ocean in this wondrous way. Uh Jude, I have, I have a funny side note. I wrote a large part of my book in Sitka, Alaska on a, on a winter fellowship. I spent, spent a few months in the winter in Alaska to write my book away from my family. Uh, I was lucky, lucky to be received back 
but I, I got to um, uh, spend time with Ed Ricketts' daughter, Nan Ricketts, uh, who's retired to Sitka, Alaska. And um, I got to hear all about uh, these stories that, that come from that. That's kind of an essential book about but it captures just how scientists are. I can remember specific passages from that book. And if you've ever been to Baja, California, and Mexico, you, you can really imagine how it must have looked like to have, the, have these scientists traipsing about, coming off a boat and getting back on a boat and going farther down and around the peninsula. Uh, I, I love that book. Yeah, well, I wish I could have met his daughter too. I mean, that's amazing. But, but again, you wanna communicate the truth of doing science, but you also want to try to get people excited about the world, the planet. Um, I don't know, it's a hard job, but it's fun. That's anyway. good. I'm glad that it is fun. And it sounds like it is fun for all three of you. And I think we've kind of circled around this question, but I guess I'll directly come out and ask it. So Michael, thank you for asking this question. Um, and it was to, to you, Jude, but it said, share how you think an interest in mysteries can identify people who have a resonance with science. Um, and, you know, was that the primary intent in writing your novel? And I think we've kind of like skirted around that question with um, Nick's comments and with Jude about like how novels can really influence people's trains of thought and how, you know, pursuing all these different um, you're constantly taking in information. And this goes back to what Tiffany said too about, you know, it's all data. And sometimes we get ideas from things or we like resonate with something um, that we read and we may not even realize like, oh, well, I'm really into books. I'm really into reading. And I pick up Jude's book and it like happens to have all these marine science terms and, you know, talks about like the, the process of working at a marine station a little bit. And I mean, obviously through, through this lens of, the mystery something washes up on the beach and you know what is it and what happens and there's murders and mystery it's like very exciting but you know well, people they're... are listening to or listening or reading it and they're like oh maybe I like marine science maybe this is something I could get into well they might I mean it's probably unlikely but mystery readers mysteries are extremely popular and there are you know dozens and dozens of different kinds within the genre but um the people who read them on the whole are really intelligent people and uh they like to solve a puzzle if they're like me they may think i want to learn something in solving this puzzle you can have a comic mystery, you can have a very brutal mystery, you can read real Scandinavian noir and <laughs> get frightened so you can't go to sleep at night. But, but telling, even with that, telling about somebody's life in a different culture is fascinating. So whether they become marine biologists or just maybe when they pick up the paper and see something about a new whale, they'll read it. That's all you're trying to do. And you do want to entertain people. This is not great literature. This is, what would, what do you call it at the Smithsonian? I don't know. They probably don't like to use the word edutainment, but I mean, it is, that's what it is you're getting people you know you're getting people interested in a topic that they might not necessarily have been interested in you don't have to be a marine biologist to read a marine biology mystery and you know and and get in, inspired and I think that reflects like Nick in your work what you said about you know whales and Tiffany you see this in in your you know in some of your stuff that's featured in Alert Diver and in the Keys Keys Weekly like these are people who might not necessarily have any marine background and you're getting them up to speed on a really complex marine topic, like pretty, pretty quickly, especially Tiffany for you in two to three minute reads, you know, you have to get these, your audience up to speed super fast. And Nick, if your audience is mostly high school students and, and, and early, um, well, mostly high school, you said, right? Not, not that's not um, your whole yeah. audience, but that you find there's a lot of people that are that age group reading um, your book, I mean, they might not even know much about biology. Right, yeah, and that's that's one of the challenges I think about, um, you know, you kind of put your finger on, on the core is that um, 
the world is full of real mysteries and that's kind of the job of scientists of science is to 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 understand what's going on we're not always successful and sometimes it just leads to more knock-ons to more and more mysteries um knowing who the audience is is um i kind of think it's um it has a lot to do with the the mode that you try to communicate in and the venue that you undertake so if you want to write um uh, uh, a mystery uh, novel, you kind of know the, the audience who's signing up for that. Uh, and the same is true for a news piece or, uh, you know, and in the case of nonfiction, a lot of different people can come to it. And so I think um, there's challenges in, in all cases to know what the reader really wants to know. And, and uh, it's, you know, scientists have the problem, I think, of dishing too much information and the challenge is really holding back on what is, it, it's not just figuring out what's essential, but what you need to throw away and that you can then bring back later. And if you have a book, you can bring that back later. You can just bury it in the end notes or just point to a, a, a bibliographic reference, but it's, um, you gotta have to kind of figure that out and, and understand what you're gonna leave in and what you're gonna leave out. Yeah, dialing it in is important. I think that's a really good segue for another question that we have for you, Tiffany. Um, Aaron asks, can you tell us where you get ideas for your articles um, and, and like how that shapes? Because you kind of get to pick what you write about and how do you dial it in and choose like what you're going to write about? Sure. Um, so I, I think about what would be interesting to my non- so I write for um, one pretty heavily environmental newspaper, but then the rest are general public. So I think about what kind of a story my family would want to hear at the dinner table. Like if I told them, would they just be like, all right, pass the potatoes? Or would they be like, oh, that's cool. Tell me more. And so I tailor which stories go to which outlet or how I spin the story for both outlets in a very different way. Like the general public, I'm like, oh, look, dead whale, new species, plastic, you know, crazy with a touch of like climate change in there. But uh, for the newspaper, that's all environmental. I can be like, you know, endangered species. And like, it's actually this species. And they looked at the skull to understand. So you can spin the same story multiple ways. And it it it's totally on your audience. But I always start with the one like the spark in the story. Cause I know what, when things capture me. So I start with that spark that I want that specific audience to walk away with. And then I build my story around it so that I make sure that that's the focal. And then yeah, restraint, like Nick was saying, so hard, but so important. Cause otherwise you will drown them in information. Cause you're, you want to scream about climate change and oceans and everything, but you can't, it's, it's a two minute piece. Two to three minute article read. And I, this is a really good, the restraint that you mentioned because Iris asked another really good question. Um, so besides identifying your audience, how do you narrow down the topic in terms of like length of communication, length of your communication articles? And then Iris is a scientist at the Marine Station also says, um, we as scientists struggle to communicate, communicate our work truly in art that you guys do. So um, maybe you wanna touch a little bit more on that since we're here talking about <laughs> restraint. Yeah. Um, I, I again, think about like, I know I nerd out when I'm like, oh, it's connected to this and this, but then I'm like, okay, if they don't even know what, like what causes climate change, they're not going to understand the nuance of, you know, like think, you know, a bio pump going in the ocean. So I'm going to just stick to the first fact, you know, and then you can slowly, if you keep writing regularly for like a news outlet, in my case, you can build up the audience's general knowledge. That's the hope, right? Like, I think it's a great opportunity to expand their awareness, but I usually try not to go more than one and a half, two levels deeper than the main point. Otherwise you get lost in the nuances. That's awesome that, I mean, it's, it's such a fine tuning. You have to keep trialing things. And maybe Nick and Jude, you've experienced this also like in your work. And it is just really dialing it in and drilling down into whatever that is. Like with Tiffany, it de definitely a different platform, a totally different vibe to the, the writing, not necessarily writing style, but just to the, the objective, I guess, 
And Nick and Jude, I mean, you, do you guys find that you struggle to really pick a topic to write about or does it come kind of naturally or you just sort of start writing and it, it, it happens along the way? Well, a lot happens along the way. And I've read so many books on writing, but a lot of people say you should start with short stories. Well, I never liked short stories. I like long stories and long, long stories, such as series. Um, but in the process of my writing, I found I'm throwing out an awful lot of what I thought was brilliant when I first when I ate my sandwich and <laughs> wrote it down. And that was where the editor was so helpful. So I do recommend that if you're trying to write a novel at least. And it's good for nonfiction too, but you're not as likely to get that. Well, you can get good, really good nonfiction editors too, but you pay in most cases. Uh, I'm sorry, the question was, I, I kind of lost the- thread. Oh, so just to talk about like, how do you choose um, a topic and really drill down into it? And oh. like, how, like, how did, did you land on that? Like through other writings or did you know like that when you started that's what you wanted to write about from the beginning? I mean, uh, these days when I, when I uh, there's a lot of topics to, to write about. So, right. and not that, you know, during a pandemic there's only so many hours in the day to actually focus on something, but um, I'd say for at least um, a writing spine on whales, I kind of picked up vignettes and kind of cobbled together vignettes together. And they just, they're all, it's almost like a, the, the snowball effect where you start with the nucleus and start rolling it and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's, that's kind of my process for writing. Um, but I think any kind of science, there's always a story to talk about. And uh, what I really wanted to do, at least with Spine on Whales, was point out that um, how scientists figure something out is as important as what they figure out. And to know how they figured it out, you actually have to know something about the scientists um, themselves. And that um, really makes you have to um, be carried along with the narrative and to trust the narrator and actually know something about the interpersonal relationships of who's doing what and why. And because um, that's really real for my world. Uh, I work with people around the world. I have students from all, all over who come to Washington DC to use our collections to, to conduct their own research and collaborate. And that's some of the most enriching parts of the science I do is, is having uh, an interaction across space and time uh, that, that persists. And you're in every case you're trying to grapple with a mystery and try to understand something. So uh, yeah, the mystery is the hook. But I think what's really valuable is to dispel the myth that um, one person figures it, out, it all out in science, uh, or that um, there's easy answers and it's all clean and tidy. That's just not the case. It's never clean and tidy, and it's never as clean and tidy as it looks from the surface either. When you you know get to it, once you start digging in, it's like stuff's everywhere. And you need more and more people to help collaborate with you because it's not sometimes it feels like it's not something you can ever get to on your own um, and just the input of others and working collaboratively I think maybe you could if I get a lot of nodding from all three of you like working collaboratively collaboratively has been really um, something that moves your work forward yes head shakes <laughs> okay cool um, we're going to take one more question from our audience, and I think it's a really interesting one um, because you all come from very different backgrounds, um, but William asks, what would you suggest to someone who is contemplating going to school in science versus writing? So um, I think maybe just in the terms of for writing, um, it's a hard question, but maybe you can all kind of speak to really quickly, like what was your, how you made your decision and you kind of all ended up here. So if there was one moment where you were like, oh yeah, it's this. Tiffany, do you wanna start? Sure. So, um, I mean, I contemplated that exact thing and I decided against going back to school because I I didn't feel like, um, the, like the planet had enough time for me to go back to catch up on science. Like I hadn't taken science since high school. So I would have to go through all of college and then specialize, 
went and then I got some really great advice, which may be pertinent to um, William. Uh, someone told me like, why are you trying to start over? Like, don't, you don't have to start over in the mailroom every time you, you jump into something like writing or art or whatever, you know, new medium you're trying hop in the side door, right? He was like, you're a lawyer, you know how to write. It's just legal. So segue your skill set and hop in, you know, sneak in the side door and skip a couple steps. And so that helped me reframe my own skill set and decide to just, you know, try writing for the local newspaper. So like, if you want to write, take a writing class, you know, contact your local newspaper. They always take contributed pieces for free. Like if you're willing to write for free, you can get something published under your name. Like it's not exceedingly hard, but then you get the practice. And it's a foot in the door to help you build, you know, your CV if you find that like this is a way that you want to move yeah. forward. And, and test if you like it. And if you don't, maybe you do go back to school, but at least you tried. Jude, what do you think? You're muted, my darling. I came in at a time when there was a lot of pressure to do science. I think there's some of that pressure again today with STEM and whatever. STEM, STEAM, whatever it is. STEAM is just including art, but STEM okay. is, if you're not familiar, science, and technology, and I engineering, math. And I was, but um, it evolves. So take a science course and a writing course is what I would say. Um, and write, because if you go for science, you'll spend most of your life writing. So writing, presenting, and publishing and fighting with reviewers sometimes. Not speaking from personal experience or anything. Oh, no, no. We're all very collaborative. Nick, what about you? I think it's a very simple piece of advice, which is, and it serves you well, whether you want to do writing or science, uh, which is to read broadly and read outside your comfort zone as much as possible and read, read good writing. Um, you, you'll know it when you see it, and it will, it will become really clear to you and become a student of good writing. Really ask yourself when you read something that, you know, it can be uh, an article, a, a science a journalism piece, it could be a novel, or it could be a nonfiction book. Uh, but in every case, you should be asking yourself if you wanna get better at it, what makes this good? What makes it compel, what makes it sticky? And um, there are qualities to good writing. And, uh, you know, the thing is, everybody is still learning how to be a better writer. Uh, nobody's born that way. And it's okay to admit that um, you're still learning how to do that. Yeah, I think that's really good. I think that's really good advice. And one of the things I like to always do when we end our sessions is to, this I do as like a gem for the people who hang in there all the way to the end. Um, and it's to leave with your, you know, one little like nugget of wisdom that you can instill um, with our audience, like if they are interested in pursuing a sort of like writing and science hybrid, or um, maybe it could be a piece of advice on like how, you know, something you wish someone would have communicated with you earlier or anything like that. So um, I'll do mine because I think it reflects what Nick just said, and then we'll kind of round robin it through and then we're going to finish up our program. Um, but mine is reflecting of what Nick just said is that you have to start somewhere. And if you think that you're going to be great right when you start, you're really going to be mistaken. And it's okay to not be good at something. Like not being good at something is the first step in getting good at something. Um, and I think there's a lot of pressure, especially on young people now with everything on social media and everyone putting their things in a very, very open platform that everyone seems like so much better than you. So why even try? But if you're passionate about something, you just have to start. And sometimes you have to start where you're at. And sometimes where you're at is not very good, but you will get better. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so let's go, Jude, why don't you, or if you're ready, do you want to give your advice? Sure. Um, my advice is right. <laughs> Nothing makes up for that. You can take, you can read all the books and you should, but 
what you need to do is write every day. I've kept journals since high school. I write haiku poetry, which has amazingly helped me a lot with writing concise species descriptions of new taxa and old taxa. Um, they're just, there's no way out except practice, unfortunately. And Nick? I definitely echo the, the right, right, right. Uh, it's really hard to do. And so writing is hard, writing well is really hard. Uh, but what I, what I would say is that um, it's also about finding a community of people who will support you and mentor you. And your mentor, your network of mentors should be plural for one. Uh, it should include people who, um, feel, uh, who you feel seen by. And that can be different kinds of people in different phases of your career and your life. And I, I've learned how important it is to continually refresh that because uh, it's a sign of you developing if you find that you need new mentors for doing new things. And Tiffany, last but not least, the last, last nugget of wisdom. I would say stay eager and open to what you can learn because it'll keep your life interesting and your stories good. Fabulous. Thank you all so very much for joining us today for this panel. I know it feels a little different than other panels that you've maybe been on or other webinars, but we like to keep it open. And I really wanna say thank you to all of our amazing um, participants who asked questions. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, um, please follow up with us. We've put a lot of information in the chat for you. So I just wanna point you if you're interested in learning more, um, or if you want to ask us a question and follow up, you can always email us at smseducation at si.edu. And Erin has put that in the chat for you. Um, for whatever reason, if we didn't get to your question today, please send us an email and we will pass it along to either the panelists who it's applicable to or all of our panelists if, if it um, requires their attention. And we will hound them to make sure that they email you back. So don't worry. Um, so I guess without, you know, without lingering too long, I really do wanna just say like, thank you, Tiffany, thank you, Jude, thank you, Nick, for participating in this. Um, this is the second time we've hosted this program and we do have a third one coming up in May. So May 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please join us for our third um, and final Art of Science lecture, webinar, panel. I'm not really sure. Um, I'm still learning too, you gotta to start somewhere. We're going to be talking to some really awesome panelists who specialize in film and photography. So if that's something you're interested in hearing a little bit more about or learning, you know, about some journeys, um, we have some really, really interesting panelists for that. So make sure you follow along with us on Facebook, on Instagram, um, on YouTube. You can really find us anywhere at Smithsonian SMS. And we put a lot of the um, links to our amazing panelists if you want to follow their journeys and keep an eye out for their maybe their second books, third books, their, their news articles, um, and you can really find them anywhere in the world. So um, thank you guys again. It was a pleasure. Thanks everyone. Feel free to get in touch. Thanks so much for letting us share. <laughs> yeah, thank you to Laura and Aaron and uh, all the panelists. It was really great talking about all this. Uh, Awesome. Thank you guys. And thank you to everyone who attended and we'll see you next time. Bye.